Dear Father, dear God, thank you for bringing us together to look at your word and at Bible truth and at Jesus Christ as our righteousness. And we pray for the Holy Spirit, please. Lord, I know that this is your message and you, you are calling your people to give your message to the world. And we need to understand it and experience it its power. And we pray for your blessing right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's see. Where are my glasses? Got to get the right glasses on. <clears throat> Revelation 14, verse 9 says, The third angel followed them, saying with what kind of a voice? With a loud voice, right. I really believe that the time is going to come when the third angel's message is going to be shared loudly with this world. I, 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 my conviction is that God has allowed the technology that is here. He's allowed this for a reason because he wants to use it to lighten the earth. Amen. Now, technology isn't going to lighten the earth. It's the message of Jesus that's going to lighten the earth but he's going to use technology. You know, it's really interesting that, that if you go back 2,000 years ago, it said, the Bible says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. And in Desire of Ages, it talks about how part of the fullness of time was the fact that there was one dominant empire, which was the Roman Empire, and there was a, there was a generally a common language. And then there was a common system of roads. And there was a whole situation that God had been developing and that he knew this is, this is the context, that I'm going to spread the message of Jesus and the, his resurrection and the Holy Spirit coming down on the day of Pentecost uh, into the Roman world. And that's what allowed Christianity to spread out and to become you know, what it became at just a few years after the resurrection. There was, a, there was a common language, there was communication, there was roads, there was one empire. The time was ripe for the gospel to spread in the Roman world. And I think we're just about there again, that we're getting close to the fullness of time. And to me, it's not an accident that this technology is here that we can be recording these programs and these programs can go out online and people can watch them or listen to them. Uh, you know, you can do a video. We can, we can stream this live. Uh, our, our ministry, White Horse Media, we feel deeply convicted that, you know, more and more God wants us to be using the technology that's available through Facebook and Twitter and, and YouTube and, you know, this is here for a reason. God is, is preparing something. We know the devil's using technology. We know that. But the Lord is using it too. And I believe God is getting things ready for the final burst that's going to lighten the whole earth with its glory. You know, just think how amazing, I've, I've often thought about this, how amazing it was when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into that burning, fiery furnace. And then Nebuchadnezzar thought that they were all going to you know, burn up. And then he looked and they were still standing there. And then he said, there's a fourth one in there. And that fourth one looks like the son of God. And then he called them to come out. <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out. And I've thought about that. I thought, if I would have been Shadrach, I wouldn't have come out right away. I would have, you know, if I'm there in the fire with Jesus... I would like to stay there for a while and talk to the Lord. I have a higher king that I'm following, not Nebuchadnezzar. So who knows how long they, they, st they stayed there and talked to Jesus, but eventually they came out. And have you thought about that moment when these three men walked out of that pit, whatever it was, and they walked out in front of the whole Babylonian kingdom of all their administrators. And at that moment, the eyes of, the, of all the administration, they were glued to these three men.
who, who had no, who were not burned up, who walked out of that fire. I mean, that, that must have been one of the most powerful witnessing moments in, in history. The whole Babylonian empire, at least those that were, you know, it, the administration as far as we know, they were all there and they were staring at these three men. Three men. First angel, second angel, third angel. Three angels. And the time is going to come when God's message of the three angels is going to command the attention of the world. And just like Babylon looked at those three men, so the world is going to look at the three angels. And I think that technology is going to be part of this. God doesn't need uh, millions and millions and millions of people to finish his work. He's going to finish his work with the group that he needs, you know, his 300 or his 7,000 or however many he has. Reminds me of another text. I'm going to go back to Revelation, but another verse just came to my mind. Romans chapter 9. Yeah, we'll hold on to Revelation. Romans 9, 28. We'll come back to Revelation. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't have a lot of notes in front of me right now. You know, I, these are six presentations that your conference president has asked me to put together in a short time. And I've had a lot of other things on my plate. And I've been, you know, had travel problems. And, but I know this information in my mind. And so I've just been praying, Lord, as I stand before this crowd in Michigan, you know, guide my mind Amen. to what you want me to talk about. So this is not scripted, just like I've got, you know, I'm wearing my, <laughs> my, my poncho because I don't have any other clothes because my luggage hasn't gotten here yet. Uh, this is going to be kind of informal, but we want the Lord to be our teacher. We want God's blessing here. Now look at this text, Romans 9, 28. Actually, we can read verse 27 as well. Isaiah also cries concerning Israel, though the, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will do what? He will finish the work. You know, we often talk about finishing the work. Lord, help us to finish the work. When's the work going to get finished? But if we, if we think that we're going to finish the work, it's not going to get done because we just can't finish the work. There's too many people in this world for us to finish the work. But the good news is the Bible doesn't say we're going to finish the work. The Bible says he will finish the work, right? And he will cut it short. And what does he cut it short in? Righteousness. Right, there's the message of the righteousness of Christ. He will finish the work and he will cut it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. When, when his people are ready, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when we're ready, God's going to finish this work. And just like the, world, the Babylonian world looked at those three men, the world is going to look at us. And God's going to use technology and he's going to use his prepared people to get his message out rapidly. It's just going to fly all over the world. It's going to lighten the earth. An angel's going to come down from heaven with great power. And the earth will be lightened with his glory. And he's going to be in charge. God's going to take the rain into his own hands. The rain's into his own hands. And, and uh, we can be part of that. Doesn't that sound good? Yeah. Praise the Lord. So who knows exactly what God has in store for us this week. He's getting us ready. Okay, back to Revelation 14. The third angel, verse 9, says, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice. Uh, years ago, as Whitehorse Media was developing... 
God convicted me that if I, as the speaker director of Whitehorse Media, want the Lord's blessing upon our ministry, then I need to do His will, not mine. I need to get behind His message, not mine. And I think that's one reason why God has kept our ministry through all the ups and downs and twists and turns and crises that we've been through and that you know, have been going on in the church. Uh, God has kept White Horse Media afloat because our desire is to get behind His message, not our message. And the Bible is very clear that the third angel's message is his message. As I share this on, on our videos and in, different, in front of different audiences uh, and on the radio, I often will go into Revelation 14 and show there's three angels' messages followed by the second coming. Three angels, verses 6 to 12, second coming, verses 14 to 16. And I tell people that the Bible says that right before the second coming are three angels. This is not something we made up. This is not something that we created. It's not something that Seventh-day Adventists have just, you know, made up as a theory. This is the word of the Lord. Sometime read Jeremiah 23 sometime and, and notice what it says about God's word. The Lord says, is not my word like a fire? like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. He talks about the false prophets, the false shepherds who have perverted the words of the living God and about the, uh, the, false, the false prophets who prophesy from their own mind and not from the word of the Lord. So, you know, God has just really spoken to me through the struggles that I went through in, in Pacifica and San Francisco that one verse, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. There was the path before me. The path was the word of God. Stick to the word of God. Study the word of God. Stay with the word of God. There were many, many, many times when I had to, when I realized that my mind, my thoughts, my confusion was going this direction and the word of God was going this direction. And I, I've made that choice that I'm going to give up my thoughts, give up my mind, and follow what he has to say. The Lord says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. And the best decision that we can make is to, is to choose to follow what he says instead of what we think. And it's very clear in his word in Revelation 14 that... His message is the third angel's message. The third angel followed them saying with a loud voice. And he's gonna, he's gonna, he is going to finish his work by developing a group of people who become channels for this voice in this world this high-tech world, and he's going to use YouTube, the internet, Facebook, satellite, cameras, radio, Twitter. <laughs> he can use all this. Trump's not the only one that can use Twitter. God can use Twitter too. And he's going to, I'm just convinced he's going to use all of this with a loud voice to give his third angel's message. Let me go back to that quote that we read from, it's inside of this book, it's page 12, Testimonies to Ministers, page 91 and 92. The last couple sentences, it says, all power is given into his hands, which is the hands of Jesus, that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless 
gift. And we'll talk more about that tonight. The priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. All of that's packed, isn't it? We are all helpless human agents. I'm pretty helpless. We're all pretty helpless. But God has a gift, a priceless gift of his own righteousness. And then it says, this is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. Isn't that something? So God is, you know, he's giving us a path. We need to study this message. We need to understand what is the priceless gift of his own righteousness which he will impart to the helpless human agent. We need to understand how is is that the third angel's message? How is that? And the ultimate goal is for us to experience uh, the power, the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. Doesn't that sound good? All right, back to your Bibles. Revelation 14, verses 9 to 12, is the third angel's message as it is revealed in the Bible. And the conclusion of the message is in verse 12. Actually, the end of verse 11 is about the mark of the beast, those who get the mark. And then verse 12 says, here is the patience of of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That is the conclusion of the third angel's message. Now, how does that conclusion tie in with the message of the righteousness of Jesus Christ? That's what we need to find out. That's our that's our challenge to figure this out. Now, let me just um, share some thoughts about verse 12. Verse 12 describes a people who, who do two things, right? They, on the one hand, what do they do? They keep the commandments of God. And then on the other hand, what do they do? They have the faith of Jesus. So they've got both. They've got both of those. There's a blending of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus in the experience of those saints. Right? Now, it, it, to me, it's, uh, I, I like the fact that what is the last word of the third angel's message before the period. It's Jesus. Have you ever noticed that? The third angel's message is the last message to the world before the second coming. And the last word before the last period at the end of that last message is Jesus. To me, that's impressive. Uh, The first angel has the everlasting gospel. So it starts with Jesus. The third angel talks about those who get the mark of the beast who will suffer in the presence of the lamb. And the lamb is Jesus. And then the third angel concludes with those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So Jesus is all over these messages. And of course, the book of Revelation comes from Jesus. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he's the center of all this. Now, back to the two sides, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Prophecy predicts that the saints have both. 
it seems to me as I've looked at this that down throughout Christian history at least, the pendulum has been swinging back and forth between the one side and the other side. During the time of Jesus, Jesus talked to the Pharisees over and over again, and the Pharisees would say things like, we are Moses' disciples. We follow Moses. As for this man, we don't know where he's from, if you remember that. So it seems to me that what the, what the religious leaders did in the time of Jesus was they, they focused on the commandments of God. They focused on the law. They focused on Moses. But they, when Jesus was there in front of them, they didn't want him. So they, they pit one against the other. And it seems to me that today, generally speaking, in the Christian world, the pendulum has swung over to the other side. If you look at the evangelical world, just as a whole, the focus is Jesus, the cross, grace. But they generally don't want anything to do with the law. The commandments of God, they don't want. And I'm just speaking generally. Can you see what I'm, what I'm, what I'm talking about? The pendulum keeps swinging. The Jews, it was the law, but they rejected Jesus, many of them. And today, many focus on Jesus, but they reject the law. Now, if you look at Adventist history, you see the same pendulum swinging back and forth. When the early Adventists went through the disappointment and discovered that the sanctuary was not the earth, but it was in heaven, and that the ark was there and the law was there, that's how then they discovered one, two, three, four. The fourth commandment is one of the commandments in the ark, in the heavenly temple. And then this group of Adventists became, became Seventh-day Adventists. That's how we became Seventh-day Adventists. And, but what happened was, as time went on, as the Adventist train went down the tracks, um, as Ellen White said, we've preached the law, the law, the law, until we're as dry as the hills of Gilboa. And that's what they did. They, they, it was the law, the law, the law. It's interesting that in 1888, there were Sunday laws on the horizon. The very time when the General Conference took place in 1888, there was a bill, the Blair Sunday Bill, pending in the Senate. And there was a, a push among the evangelicals for Sunday. And the, uh, the brethren wanted to make sure that if Sunday was enforced, that our arguments in behalf of the law we're strong because we've got to preach the law. So they were preaching the law, the law, the law. Today, it seems to me that even within Adventism, we, we've swung over to the other side. And when, when people talk about righteousness by faith, the righteousness of Christ, salvation by grace, it seems to me that um, too many times there's a focus on Jesus but not much focus on the commandments of God. And I think that's one reason why righteousness by faith is confusing to a lot of people. Because people talk about righteousness by faith, and they talk about grace, and they talk about faith, but they don't, you know, where's the law in all that? And it ends up, people are just confused. So I think we've kind of gone over to the other side. Now here's the amazing thing. At the, at the Minneapolis General Conference session in 1888, especially through the teachings of Wagner, when Wagner got off that train, he was from California. Some good things can come out of California sometimes. <laughs> he was a uh, co-editor with Jones of, of uh, the Signs of the Times. And when Wagner got to Minneapolis and was invited to speak to the to the brethren, and began to go through this series of Bible studies that he began to lead out in. 
what he did was he combined the law, the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus together, inseparably. So again, in Christian history, the Pharisees focused on the law, but they neglected Jesus. Today, the evangelicals focus on Jesus, but they neglect the law. In Adventist history, we focused on the law, but we neglected Jesus. And now today, many are focusing on Jesus, but they're neglecting the law. And what happened at Minneapolis was they came together. Now, I'm going to prove that to you. I'm going to show you. If you go, if you go back to your, um, your copy of God's Last Message, Christ Our Righteousness, let me show you some things here. Turn to page, chapter 2 is called Focusing the Lens. In the second paragraph of chapter 2, uh, this is page, well, 17, although this, there's no 17 there, but it's page 17. Have you ever heard of Clinton Wallen? Does that name ring a bell? Yeah. Clinton Wallen works at the, uh, the BRI. He's been here, okay. Uh, when I was at Weimar, and when I was studying the writings of Jones and Wagner, somehow I found a copy of uh, Clinton Wallen's dissertation on what Wagner preached at Minneapolis. Because he's done a lot of study in this, and his research was invaluable to me. And in this first paragraph, or second paragraph, it says here, uh, Adventist scholar Clint Clinton Wallen, in his meticulously researched article, What Did E.J. Wagner Say at Minneapolis? Taken from chapter one of his Master of Divinity thesis, he correctly declared, quote, E.J. Wagner's lectures at the Minneapolis General Conference are among the most important in all of Adventist history. Wallen reported that Wagner spoke at least 12 times at Minneapolis. On Monday, October 15, he began a series of at least nine lectures on the law and its relationship to the righteousness of Christ. So this chapter is called Focusing the Lens. When we are trying to zero in on what is that message that's going to lighten the earth with its glory, that is the third angel's message. In my research on this, the, the lens began to sharpen as I went back and read Clinton's material and began to study what did Wagner really say at Minneapolis. Now, they didn't have recording equipment. It wasn't streamed. They didn't have YouTube or videos, and, they, and there was no audio recording. But there were people... There was a, a number of people there that, uh, by hand, recorded what Wagner said. So we can, we can piece together quite a bit of what he said. But on top of that, there was a little lady that was there. There was a little short lady that was there in the crowd at the Minneapolis General Conference session named Ellen White. And Ellen White listened to Wagner. And she later reflected and wrote down the most important things that she got from Wagner's teaching. And those are on page 18. On page 18. And, and actually, some of this is taken from a little book. You can get this from Layman Ministry News. It's called 1888 Sermons and Morning Talks by Ellen White, taken from the 1888 General Conference Session. This is actually Ellen White's reflections of what she heard and what happened at Minneapolis. And uh, this is quoting from here. I think I've got that quote, the footnote there in my book. is right out of page 57 of this book, and it's right here on page 18 of this book. You've got the source material as well. So this is what she said, top of page 18. She said, I see the beauty of the truth 
in the presentation of the righteousness of Christ in relation to the law as Dr. E.J. Wagner has placed it before us. If our ministering brethren would accept the doctrine which has been presented so clearly, the righteousness of Christ in connection with the law, and I know they need to accept this, this, their prejudices would not have a controlling power and the people would be fed with their portion of meat in due season. Now, I want you to you know, kind of focus your, focus your lens on this, that what Ellen White identified twice in this paragraph as being the beautiful truth that Wagner preached at Minneapolis, and Wagner did this just by standing up and reading the Bible and then explaining the Bible. He went through nine lectures on the righteousness of Christ in relation to the law and he did it from Romans, he did it from Galatians, and he focused also on the book of Revelation. And Ellen White heard that and said it was a beautiful truth that was clearly presented, and she says it twice, the righteousness of Christ in relation to the law. You see that? So what's happening here is that we have the commandments of God on the one side, we have the faith of Jesus on the other side, we have Christian history swinging back and forth. We have Adventist history swinging back and forth. And then we have Wagner standing up in front of the brethren in 1888 and combining them. He combines the, the uh, righteousness of Christ and how it is in relation to the law. Next paragraph, if you go, if you go down to the next key paragraph, this is also Ellen White's reflection. This is from an article called Looking Back at Minneapolis. And here she says the same thing. Page 18. Elder E.J. Wagner had the privilege granted him of speaking plainly and presenting his views upon justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ in relation to the law. This was no new light in other words, it was, she said he, he didn't make this up. Wagner got it from Paul. <laughs> he got it from Romans and Galatians. That's why it's not, it wasn't new. But it was new to them. But it was old light placed where it should be in the third angel's message. So what Wagner did was he, he took the law and the gospel, put them together, Based on Romans and Galatians, he took that old light, but he put it into the third angel. Now, that was new, because the brethren were not doing that. The brethren were preaching the law, the law, the law. And they were leaving out the gospel, especially in the light of the Sunday laws that were on the horizon. Then she says, at this meeting, I bore testimony that the most precious light has been shining forth. And where's that light shining forth from? From the scriptures. So where, can, where do we go to find it? We can find it in the Bible. Jones, during uh, one of the general conference sessions, he, he clarified that the purpose of the spirit of prophecy was to help us to find the message right here in the Bible and to get it here. So God has given us Ellen White. He's also given us the early writings of Jones and Wagner. And these writings will help us to understand the Bible so we can get the most precious light from the scriptures. And then it's from the scriptures that we give it to the world through the technology that's available to us in these last days. This is where God is leading He's leading us to get this message from the Bible. Okay, most precious. At this meeting, I bore testimony that the most precious light has been shining forth from the scriptures in the presentation of the great subject. Now notice this. Look carefully at this. The great subject of the righteousness of Christ connected with the law 
which should constantly be kept before the sinner as his only hope of salvation. Are you, are you with me? So, you know, as I was at Weimar trying to figure this out, <laughs> just like you guys are trying to, you know, we're all trying to figure this out. We're, we all are. It became, it became very clear to me that the third angel's message is the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That's, the, that's what the Bible says. This message is to lighten the earth. And the, and the pendulum has been going back and forth between one and the other, one and the other, one and the other. And what happened at Minneapolis, what makes this so important is that at Minneapolis, God raised up a man. He raised up two men, Jones and Wagner, and he gave them a message and he helped them to understand from the Bible how the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus come together how the righteousness of Christ in relation to the law, how this fits. And it's almost, it's kind of like when you, you know, you combine uh, wires, you combine a negative and a positive, and if you combine these wires and touch them, what happens? You know, you get a spark, you get an explosion. And that's what happened at Minneapolis. The, the, the combination came together. And it was powerful. Ellen White had not heard men communicating like this. She said this was old light, but it's in the, in the, in the midst of the third angel in a way that we've never seen this before. As Seventh-day Adventists, they had not seen that before. And what happened was the brethren, or many of them, uh, they resisted that because they were afraid and I'll explain the reason why they were afraid. They were afraid that Wagner's arguments would undermine their arguments in the face of Sunday laws that, that were coming. Now, before, but before I get to that, I want to show you something else. Turn the page. Chapter 3 is called, This Message Will Lighten the Earth. And that's what I've called this message, part two of the six-part series. Now, why did I pick that name, This Message Will Lighten the Earth? Well, here's the reason why. And this chapter describes this. Two years prior to the Minneapolis General Conference, Ellen White was in Switzerland. She was traveling in Switzerland, and she had an encounter with an angel. This is kind of a sideline, but I remember some time ago I was at... Uh, Ellen White's old house in Elmshaven. Have any of you ever been visited that place? Okay, many, most of you, or a lot of you have. And I remember there was one of the, uh, one of the people there, I think it was the lady that gave the tour, which I think was her, grand, her granddaughter, still alive. She was quite elderly. And she said, I think it was her, that there were times when Ellen White was alive that the servants would gather outside of her, they would gather outside the house and they'd look up to the, I think it was the second story window or the third story window where her room was. And they would see at night, there would be a light coming out of that room. And the servants knew that Ellen White was in that room being instructed by an angel. And one time, uh, an, an angel left the room and walked down the hallway and crossed somebody. It might have been Uriah Smith or somebody had crossed them as they walked in. And Ellen White said to the person that walked in, did you see the angel? You just crossed him in the hallway. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think he did. But this lady was really instructed by angels. And in, uh, in 1886, she was in Switzerland and she was instructed by an angel. And this is what she said. She related this, if you look at page 21, at the top, it says, two years later in Minneapolis, in an address entitled to my brethren assembled in general conference, Mrs. White divulged what the angel said. So now here she is at Minneapolis telling the, the, the brethren what happened. And she says, 
Two years ago, while in Switzerland, I was addressed in the night season by a voice which said, follow me. Many things were spoken which I will not now present to you. I was told that there was need of a great spiritual revival among the men who bear responsibilities in the cause of God. Now, that's us, right? We are people that bear responsibilities in the, in the cause of God, men and women. We must search the scriptures for evidences of truth. The Seventh-day Adventist message is based on the Word of God. It's based on the Bible. And then listen to this. There are but few, and this is the angel now talking to her. There are but few, even of those who claim to believe it, that comprehend the third angel's message. And yet this is the message for this time. It is present truth, but how few take up this message in its true bearing and present it to the people in its power. With many, it has but little force. So this is, this is the words of the angel. So the angel's basically saying when we really understand the third angel's message, when we really get it, what's in that message, there is a power that is in that message that we've never known. Tremendous power. Now listen to this. Said my guide... This is a direct quote from the angel. There is much light yet to shine forth from the law of God and the gospel of righteousness. So do you see how you see the combination? The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They're combining. That's what Ellen White saw Wagner teaching. Four times she said that his message was the righteousness of Christ in relation to the law. The third angel's message is the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You following me? It's that combination. The pendulum's always swinging back and forth. The third angel has the combination. Wagner had the combination. And the angel had the combination. <laughs> This message understood in its true character and proclaimed in the Spirit will lighten the earth with its glory. If we can get a hold of this, and if we can understand this, and, and, and we're not, you know, I'm not saying that we're going to understand this because I'm going to give you some new. Steve Wahlberg version of the 1888 message. I don't want a Steve Wahlberg version of the 1888 message. And I don't want to give that version to you. You don't need it. What you need is the Lord's version of his message. And that was one thing that was so powerful about A.T. Jones. When he was teaching at the 1893 and 1895 General Conference, when Ellen White stood behind those men in spite of the controversy of people that were against them because they were afraid that their teaching would undermine their arguments in favor of the law during the Sunday law crisis, Ellen White backed them. She backed Jones and she backed Wagner. And as she did that, this gave the, these two men tremendous credibility. And so Wagner gave, continued to give uh, talks at general conference sessions, not just 1888, at 1891. And then Jones was the main speaker in 1893 and in 1895. And those bulletins, somebody handed me a copy of one of those bulletins they brought, they brought here. Was it, was it you? Somebody had one of those bulletins, the 1895 General Conference Bulletin. Okay, you have it. Just hold that up. Hold, that's the 1895 General Conference Bulletin, talks by Jones to the brethren in 1895. The 1893, I think the 1893 is even better. You can get those from Layman Ministry News. It's the only place, well, it's one of the main places that I know where you can get those. And, uh, and Jones, what was so powerful about Jones when he was teaching the brethren, just like, you know, sort of like I'm doing right now, you know, going through this with the 
the ministerial force of the Michigan Conference, uh, Jones did the same thing with the brethren in 1893 and in 1895. And over and over again, he would tell people, he would say things like, you know, this is not my message. Let's get it from the Word of God. Let's let the Lord teach us His Word for His people in this hour. And let's have His Spirit giving us this message. It's very powerful. And he was very humble when he did it. He said, brethren, it's not me giving you, you know, my own ideas. He said, I just want to get the message from the Lord and give it to you. And then we want to get the message and give it to the world. That's what we need. So, you know, we need to get away from, from this whole idea of this is this person's version of righteousness by faith and this is that person's version of righteousness by faith. We don't need any of that. What we need is the Lord Jesus Christ to be our teacher. I need him to teach me just like you need him to teach you. And if I'm right with God, he can use me to teach you and he can use you to teach others. And he can use all of us to teach the world. And when the third angel's message finally hits to the world, you know, thank God for the spirit of prophecy and I thank God for the writings of Jones and Wagner. I've learned so much from them. But I'm going to give this message to the world. I'm going to give it from my Bible. The, earth, the message that's going to lighten the earth with its glory is going to come from Scripture. We're not going to stand before CNN or Fox News or, or ABC or, or NBC or all the major networks that are going to be covering that group of people that are not going along with the mark of the beast. And we're not going to be giving this message, you know, for, we're not going to grab testimonies to ministers. We're not going to grab Wagner's book, Christ and His Righteousness. We're going to grab our Bibles. We have to have this message down from the Bible. And the wonderful thing is, is it's in the Bible. It's right there, which we will we'll look at in our next meeting. But I'm just kind of preparing the way. So back to the angel. Said my guide, page 21, there is much light. How much light? Much light. There's a lot of light for us that is yet to shine. So the angel said this in 1886, and a lot of that light started shining in 1888. There's much light yet to shine forth from the law of God and the gospel of righteousness. This message, understood in its true character and proclaimed in the spirit, will lighten the earth with its glory. The great decisive question is to be brought before all nations, tongues, and people. That's our, that's our challenge. We are to give this message to the whole world, to this world, this YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Democrat, Republican, divided world. We're to give this message to this world during the loud cry in the final hours. And we're to do it right from the Bible. The closing work of the third angel's message will be attended with a power that will send the rays of the sun of righteousness into all the highways and byways of life. And decisions will be made for God as the supreme governor and his law will be looked upon as the rule of his government. There was power on the day of Pentecost. There was power during the seventh month movement in the summer of 1844. And there will be power. There was power at Minneapolis. And there will be, there will be tremendous power that is going to accompany the closing work of the third angel's message. And we have a chance to be part of that. And that power is connected, as we've read clearly here, it's connected with the law of God and the gospel of righteousness combined. 
See that? Are you following me? That's where the power is. If we just preach the commandments of God and leave out Jesus, there's no power. But if we just talk about Jesus, 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 and we leave out the commandments of God, there's no power either. Ellen White says that. She says it's the two of them blended. That's where the power comes. And that's what the angel said. In fact, I think I've got that quote. Where is that quote? Explosion at Minneapolis. Okay, in the time, I've got five minutes left. I want to look at one more quote. If you go to page uh, 22, 22, the chapter is called Lucifer Hates This Truth. And if you look at the bottom of the page, there's a quote from this page and on to the next page from First Selected Messages, page 234 and 235. In, in this book, it's on page 22 and 23. This is something Ellen White wrote in 1896. So now we're down uh, eight years after Minneapolis. She's reflecting. And she says here, the law, she's quoting Galatians 3.24, which was one of Wagner's favorite texts. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. So there's Paul showing that the law brings us to Christ. It's in the Bible, right? The evangelicals say, we don't need the law, now we have Jesus. And I've, and I've had people quote this verse to me. And I'll say, you know, you need to really take a close look at that verse. That verse says, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So has the law brought you to Christ? See, they don't know what they don't know, have an answer for that. Because in their mind, the law is gone. But in Paul's mind, the law brings us to Christ. Now look at this. In this scripture, the Holy Spirit through the apostle is speaking especially of the moral law. Now the, the brethren applied this to the ceremonial law. And when Wagner applied it to the... See, the, the, the brethren in 1888, they interpreted the law in Galatians to be the ceremonial law. And so they thought when the evangelicals say, quoting Galatians, and say the Ten Commandments are gone, the brethren said, no, our answer to them is the Ten Commandments are not gone because uh, that's just the ceremonial law. And they felt that when the Sunday laws were about to come, that they had to tell the, the world that the Ten Commandments were still there and that, and that Paul in, in Romans and Galatians was referring to the ceremonial law, not the Ten Commandments. That was their argument in order to refute the Sunday keepers. But Wagner came along and said, it's the moral law. And the brethren went, wait a minute, that's impossible. If it's the moral law, then, you're, then we have no argument in front of the Sunday keepers. And then Wagner said, no, that's not true. And Ellen White said, that's not true. Wagner didn't get rid of the law, but he used it, as Paul did, as a means to bring people to Christ. So back to the quote. In this scripture, the Holy Spirit, through the apostle, is speaking especially of the moral law. She's agreeing with Wagner. The law reveals sin to us and causes us to feel our need of Christ and to flee to him for pardon and peace by exercising repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Wagner said the law is the, it's the law. In, in, in Galatians, it's the moral law. But that doesn't get rid of it. It's, all, it's there in all of its majesty, in all of its glory, in all of its forcefulness. And it shows us that we are absolutely total sinners and that we need a savior. That was the difference. Now look at this. We'll finish with this, uh, this paragraph here. An unwillingness to accept this truth 
lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message through brethren E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones. By exciting that opposition from our own brethren, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them. God was trying to get his people ready at Minneapolis for the Sunday law. And the brethren were resisting this because they thought Wagner was going to take away their arguments that they would then use to the evangelicals when the evangelicals say the law in Galatians is the moral law. The brethren would say, no, it's the ceremonial law. Ha, ha, ha. It's the ceremonial law, so the Ten Commandments are still in force. And Wagner didn't agree with that. Wagner said, it's the moral law, and so they thought, this man's dangerous. He's dangerous to Adventism, and they resisted. But they didn't realize that underneath their opposition was the devil. The devil was using them to resist the very message that we need the special power of the Holy Spirit. The enemy prevented them from obtaining the efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth to the world as the apostles proclaimed it after the day of Pentecost. Look at this. The light that is to lighten the whole earth with its glory was resisted. And by the action of our own brethren, has been in a great degree kept away from the world. So God wants to teach his people so then his people can give it to the world. And we we are to learn it from the word of God. And the angel explained that to Ellen White. It's the balance of the righteousness of Christ and the law. Paul says it in Galatians. It's the, right, it's the law connected to the gospel. It's in Romans. And you know, the best book ever written on righteousness by faith is not this book. <laughs> it is the little book, Steps to Christ. Amen. There's no greater book, I think, ever written, probably outside the Bible, than that little book. And when we understand this from the Word of God, the righteousness of Christ connected to the law, how they go together, this is the message that's going to finish the work, that God is going to use to finish the work. And we need to learn this message. This message is for us. And uh, I see my time is up. And in our next meeting, (laughs) let's pray that the light will really shine upon us, that we will understand this very message and we'll experience it, and it'll be powerful to us, and it will encourage you, it will help you, it will bless you, it will bring light to your eyes, life to your soul, and it will uh, help us get ready. Let's, uh, let's kneel and let's pray. Dear God, this is a wonderful opportunity that we all have. It's so exciting to be here. Thank you that you brought me here. In spite of all the weather difficulties, Lord, we're here together. And I, and I, I want to be uh, just a little child before you. And I pray for all of us that you will impress us that you have a message, a real message of the righteousness of Jesus Christ for us to understand from the Bible that will change our lives and lighten the earth with its glory. Please prepare us for this. Give us humble hearts, open hearts, and give us the spirit of truth to guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.